Well, I don't know about you. Have you ever slipped and fell on the ice uh, living in Minnesota for many years? There's so many times that I stepped out onto icy roads or icy sidewalks. One time, in front of a huge crowd, I had tried to climb the staircase and filled it with I found it filled with ice and slipped right down, landing on the bottom and saying, Hey, buddies, can you give me a hand? You know, sometimes in life, we just need someone to give us a hand. We need a hand to lift us up. We need a hand that can assist us. We need a hand that may steady us. Well, let me tell you, in our spiritual life, we too need a hand. We may need a hand that lifts us up, that sustains us, that assists us, that helps us. And there is a hand. There is this beautiful hand spoken of in Isaiah chapter 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee, lift you up, sustain you, assist you with my right hand of righteousness. Today, I'm talking about that right hand of righteousness. I'm talking about that hand that lifts us up. I'm talking about that which will sustain us and assist us in the journey of our life. I invite you now, let's open our hearts to what God has in store for us. Would you join with me in prayer? Let's just center our hearts. Let's just take this moment to acknowledge the divine presence eager to speak because we've set that as our attention. In the beginning, we set that as our prayer, the prayer for one another, the prayer for ourselves. Join with me. And this we know to be our truth. This divine presence is present here and now, speaking to us, working in us, through us, and around us. We are so aligned and so in tune, for we open up the very windows of our soul to receive all that the Spirit of God has to offer us. We allow it in a sense of being the student in the great presence of the teacher. We allow the Spirit now to guide us into greater wisdom and greater understanding. With gratitude, we now we express that this is exactly what's transpiring within our hearts and our lives, for we are in tune. With the very voice of God, we appreciate it, we celebrate it, and we release this now as our truth, as together we say, and so it is. Well, that wonderful hand of God is there for us at all times. That wonderful hand to assist and guide us at all times. Because that right hand of righteousness that Scripture is speaking of is the right hand of truth. Righteousness being right thinking, clear thinking, thinking that's in line with the mind of God. So when we understand what the ancient truth, the wisdom of this text is unfolding for us, is that the right hand of God, the side of truth, the right thinking is available for us at each and every time in every moment within the journey of our lives. And that right thinking is like a hand that will lift us up. That righteous thinking is that which sustains us and will guide us. When we may slipping and falling on the icy roads of life, not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, there's a hand that steadies us and guides us. There is a hand that we can reach out and take that will sustain us and allow us to rise up and to be something greater than what we may have thought we could be. This hand is the side of truth or the side of power. Truth is that power then that lifts us up. So receiving the hand of truth, receiving the hand of this righteousness, receiving and welcoming to our own life is that which is like receiving a power that will lift us up and sustain us. For we know the scripture says, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will liberate you from any kind of bondage or any kind of fear that you've been in. The truth will liberate you and sustain you to be the child of God you're called to be. And this truth, then, is this uh, which is absolute. When we talk about truth, we're talking about that which is truly one with God all through the ages. It always has been, it is, and always will be. Truth is this absolute that is one with God. That which has been and ever will be in this truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever, as the Scripture says. For the basic principle of truth is that the mind of each individual may be consciously one with the divine mind. John so beautifully illustrated it this morning during the time of meditation when he talked about you and me coming together in one 
in the gesture of namaste. How beautiful that is as we think this is the beautiful essence of truth, that at all times, right thinking, righteousness, right way of thinking clearly is God and I coming together in a sense of one, that there is one, that this wonderful mind uh, that we have uh, may be joined with the divine mind in such power and principle and manifesting in such a great way. So what we are doing is we're becoming one with the mind of God. This is what sustains us. This is what lifts us. When you're going through these challenges in life, isn't it wonderful to know that the helping hand is this awareness of a divine mind, the mind of God, the insight of God, the wisdom of God. It's helping you in the midst of your challenge. It's helping you as you go through all these chaotic moments, these moments when you're like, I'm uncertain and I don't know where to go or what to turn. So as spiritual people, we then become seekers of this truth, seekers of this divine mind, seekers of this one mind. We covet it. We desire it. We want to seek it at all times. And we're seeking then that right hand that will lift us up from our weakness and our sickness, lift us up from our ignorance and make us whole. Now, the ancient scripture just makes it so beautiful for us because if you've been confused about what I'm talking about and you're saying, wait a minute, there's all these wonderful cliched phrases, divine mind and all this. Well, the scripture makes it so simple for us because the ancient truth found within scripture is illustrated so beautifully in story after story. And we find a simple story found in Acts chapter 3 that illustrates this very truth for our lives. It's a story of a lame man sitting outside the gate of the temple. It was the ninth hour of the day, the text says. It was in the afternoon that the disciples were coming to the temple for prayer. And they encountered a man sitting outside the temple gate. He had been lame since birth. And he was apparently brought there every day by those who were accustomed to just setting a beggar there, allowing this man to be there so that they would carry him and bring him to the temple gate and say, sit here. And for those who are coming in, they're going to have a compassionate heart and they'll certainly throw some coins your way and help you along in the spirit of compassion. And so he sat there day after day, begging, hoping, expressing this desire for help and assistance. Peter and John, the two disciples, encountered him. And in this beautiful story, the beggar asked of them uh, some alms. Can you help me out? And they turned and said, silver and gold we don't have, but we've got something better. What we have to give you is something even better than silver and gold. And they offered him the hand of truth. I love this, for in this story, they extended the right hand, the right hand being a metaphor or symbolism of the righteous thinking, handing to them, think in this way, see the world in this way, inviting the lame man to see his circumstances in a whole new way, and inviting them through him to embrace a new way of thinking by offering the right hand, to say, here, take my hand, and so doing so, let me lift you, rise you up, help you to rise to a new level. And so the lame man does so. He reaches out, takes that hand. And in that moment, there's an amazing healing happening within his life. So what we find here that there's so much to learn from this story. To do so, we have to put ourselves into the text. I love that. I can't emphasize that enough. I'm going to tell you over and over again how important it is that you put yourself in the story, that you see yourself in the very characters that are expressed because this is the way we learn the wonderful teaching and the metaphors that are brought to life through these ancient stories. So we may see ourselves from time to time as the lame man sitting outside the temple, there uh, sitting at a place where we are just unable to really comprehend or see the great things, miraculous, the power of God for our, our lives. We're dwelling in this wonderful sense, shall we say, that we're just caught up in a world of, that's not so wonderful, I should say, that just full of all of its limitations. We may be like that lame man sitting at the gate, beautiful, and lame from birth, meaning from our very moments in this world, 
we have just lived in a world of ignorance, not truly understanding that can work within us. The subconscious, that inner place of knowing in most persons, is that place from which we respond to life automatically. So it is within, with a, with a, a feeling within that's so important that we must grasp. The lame man is feeling from without, looking for something without, unable to walk, unable to stand, unable to be mobile. And by ne- neglect and the ignorance of this conscious mind, what happens then? The thinking mind isn't thinking in right thinking, righteousness. It's not thinking correctly. So the focus is in, I'm lame, I'm limited, I'm unable. And you know how often we may just begin our day with that kind of consciousness in mind? I'm lame, I'm limited, I can't get through the day, I don't see the miraculous unfolding for me. And we may be caught up in this kind of thinking, but when the subconscious mind begins to receive the truth, the truth that we're one with God, there is a great awakening that happens within us, and there's a resurrection of sleeping energies, and the power of God begins to rise up within us. We see that illustrated in this story. Now, the man is symbolic of our lives because for some of us, our spiritual life is blamed really from our mother's womb, as the text says. We're one who is laying at the door of the temple, which is called beautiful, and we keep asking for help. We're at the door of the place, of the dwelling of God. We're at the cusp. We're almost there, but we're still not receiving the fullness and not able to enter in. Interesting thing is that the lame man is sitting at this gate, which is an entrance to prayer, an entrance to this wonderful communion and expression with God. And the gate is called beautiful, which really means understanding. Ah, look at all the metaphor here. Lame man, unable to see, unable to see the goodness of God, unable to see and understand, unable to comprehend it to the fullness, just constantly embracing his inabilities and lack, is sitting outside the gate of understanding, almost there. Right there, you know, oh, so many times in our life, we've been to this place where it's like we're almost getting it, but we're not quite. We find the limitations that we have. We're almost feeling that we're so close to the miraculous unfolding in our lives. We're so close to the goodness of God being manifested within us, but we're missing, something is missing within our lives. Let me tell you, the gate beautiful is so powerful because it's a symbol of that nothing is more beautiful than understanding. Nothing is more beautiful than, aha, I get it. Nothing is more beautiful than when the light goes on within us and go, oh, now I understand. The gateway of, oh, I get it. But just outside, he remains lame. Now the door to the temple of the gate, which is called beautiful, the door is this spiritual understanding. And so often, instead of entering in, we sit at this entrance, and we're not realizing what's available to us. One of the greatest mistakes or sins or errors in thinking that we have is that we're not awakened to all the things of God that are available to us. And sometimes in our fear and our unbelief, we get frightened. Years ago, I came out as a gay man in Chicago, and I was struggling spiritually. So I went to inquire about the Metropolitan Community Church, which is a church that has a powerful message of inclusion, welcoming one another, powerful message that says God loves everyone equally and there's no partiality, a powerful message of hospitality and inclusion. And I stood outside the door. I listened to the hymns and the songs, and I I listened a little bit, but my fear and my unbelief began to grab me. And there I was on the cusp. I could have entered in. I could have received the message. I could have been open to receiving a message that would help me with my own self-acceptance and realization of who I am as a child of God. But my unbelief that said, you know what? I don't think God loves gay people. I've been taught it over and over again. I don't think that there's a place for me. I don't think that I could be loved and accepted. And so I walked away, and I never went in. It was years later that I became a pastor 
in the Metropolitan Community Churches. I finally did enter in, and I welcomed the hand of righteousness. I welcomed and received that right thinking that abolished all fear, that removed everything that was obstacles with my life. And I did, I found this openness. I found a healing, for I had been living a life as a lame person, unable to rise up, unable to move forward because of my fear and my victimhood. Let me tell you that this man is symbolic of so many of us. For some of us, our spiritual life is then lame from this point, and we have a hard time moving forward. We have a hard time embracing all that is there because of our unbelief. Chapter 3, verse 9 says this beautiful passage that awakens us. It says, so we see that we are not able to enter because of our unbelief. And the lame man could have entered in through the gate of understanding, entered in to the sanctuary the temple of the divine, the sense of knowing and the completeness of God. Beautiful metaphors here of what's possible. But what kept him on the outside was his unbelief. Just not willing to believe. Not willing to believe all things are possible. Not willing to accept this. And so what is needed to transforma for transformation to happen for this man, but what was needed is that the disciples come on the scene. It's Peter and John. And what do they represent? All through the scriptures, Peter has represented faith. Faith. Upon this rock, I will build my church, Jesus said. Upon the rock of faith, I'll build it. The church is built through the power of, of embracing faith, the power of believing all things are possible. That's what makes the church great. It's not buildings, it's not structures, it's not cathedrals that makes the church great. It's not how beautiful or the mega church or the, or the size of the church that makes the church great. It's the faith that is the rock of the church. Peter, symbolizing that rock. John, symbolizing love and great compassion. It's this that works together, and Peter and John come together, faith and love coming together within our lives. That's a transforming experience. When our faith and our feeling of love come together, we ignite something miraculous to happen within the journey of our lives. Faith is believing. It's a knowing. Love is a feeling, an emotion, and our faith grows as we affirm divine love as we begin to say, I know this love, I embrace it, and our love grows as we practice faith that says, I believe in this love and this generosity of this love. And so my faith and my love come together, and they meet us in our sense of being lame, wounded, and in our inabilities to rise up. But faith and love is there. And in this beautiful story, we find that uh, they offered to the lame man their hand. They really said, here it is. I invite you to take my hand, saying, I, I don't have any silver. I don't have any gold. I'm not going to give you material things, but I'm going to give you the right hand, the scripture says, very symbolically, the right hand, meaning the righteousness the right thinking, I'm going to impart that for you because I'm going to help you to understand and make a change. For this lame man who, care, who had been carried by so many for years and years to the gate, day after day after date, get day, it had been that he was carried by those who were so accustomed. That's right. The text, actually, if you read it, says he was carried by those who found it so normal, so accustomed, to just sit and beg. Sit in your victimhood. Stay in that place. And quite often, sometimes, our lives, we are carried through by those who continue to reform, re uh, enforce our victimhood and say, you know what? You just The best you can do is beg. The best you can do is just hope that maybe that God outside there will listen to you. The best you can do is just keep pleading and begging and interceding and hoping that maybe somehow God will hear you one day. And sometimes we're surrounded by those who constantly want us to have this kind of faith, and we miss the boat. Let me tell you this. So often we find people caught up in biblical literalism, that literalism that's constantly focusing on reading a story and seeing it from the physical. 
rather than reading the story and seeing it from the spiritual. We invite you to a metaphysical journey where you're always looking at a scripture text to find what's the spiritual truth, not always looking at the literalness of it. So it was the ninth hour of the day. So there was a temple. So there was a lame man. So there's two disciples. What does it have to do with us? Oh, but when we read the spiritual aspects, the symbolism and the metaphor for our life, we find so much there that speaks to us, that enables us to find the healing, the empowerment that we need. And so we find that there are those who are constantly looking from the literal and just saying, this is as good as it gets. The literal that says we live in a world of limitation. And as good as we can get, just sit and beg and plead. This is sometimes our great challenge that we're often, we hear from spiritual traditions is that we need to have faith in Jesus. And that's that literalism. But really what Jesus is saying is have the faith of me, of Jesus. Having faith just like Jesus is what transformed the world. Not having the faith in Jesus, for Jesus said, yes, we quote scriptures, oh, if you believe on me, what he's saying is believe on my teaching and live out that teaching in a way that you're living out the faith that I've demonstrated. You have that faith. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. It's not living uh, a life that we're constantly saying, you know, I want the faith in Jesus, but it's living the life, I want the faith of Jesus. And that's the big transformation. For these disciples, Peter and John, faith and love, we're inspiring him to embrace the faith of Jesus, an empowering faith that transformed his life. My Facebook posting this week says, if an egg is broken from the outside, life ends. But it's broken from the inside, life begins. Great things always begin from the inside. So it is that we're learning the faith of Jesus is that which resonates in the inside. Faith in Jesus is something from the outside. And we're struggling to try to say, how do we make it work? Jesus, Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, help me. And Jesus is always saying, you take the wheel. I taught you how. You take the wheel. I ask you to do the work that I have set forth as an example. You live it out. Now, Peter and John, that love and faith changed everything. Not giving material goods, but something even greater. And extending this hand of symbolic of, here's this truth. Here's what I extend to you. This wonderful right thinking that it's not bound in material things. It's not the things outside of your life that are going to help you. It's what's going on inside of your life that's going to bring great transformation in your life. Too many people are looking for something outside help when it all begins inside. When we begin to say, I can do all things through Christ. That's an inside beginning. Not, oh, could you do all things for me? Could you do somehow? Can you do it for me? But instead saying, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So Peter then and John invite the lame man to say, look upon us. In other words, get your gaze upward because the lame man is sitting down, lying down. But look upon us. Look upon faith and love. And when you do, you're going to find this transformation within your life. Because you may have been feeling like you're lame and having inability to move and be mobilized and empowered. But when we look upon faith and love, our life is transformed. I look to faith. I look to love. And I experience that these components are coming together. So the real question in our life is when you are struggling, where are you looking? Where are you looking? What are you looking at? Are you looking on the outside or are you going within and looking What's my faith? What's my belief? What do I say that I know that I know that I know? And what do I feel? Do I feel this wonderful love? Do I feel the love of God and its great generosity at all times? And stop expecting the outer and look for the inner manifestation of God. Peter and John then offered more than the tangible. They opened the door to the miraculous for this man. They saw him healed in faith and love. They offer this wonderful affirmative, this power of saying, this is what I already see for you. I say, in the name, in the character, in the way, 
in the teaching of Jesus, in the faith of Jesus. Now rise up and walk. That's what they're saying. In the character, in the name, meaning in the character, in the wonderful way, in the teaching, in the faith of Jesus, get up and walk. They didn't say, now have some faith in Jesus and Jesus will help you and Jesus will take the wheel for you. No, very simply, they said, in this way, rise up. And the man did. And suddenly, everything began to transform him. Faith and love took him by the hand, shall we say, in this analogy. The right side of truth lifted him up. And right now, began to lift him up on the side of power and authority, saying, this I believe, this I feel to be true. That's what Peter and John gave to him, saying, I see you already healed. I see this is the right thinking. I see it already done. Let me tell you, you want to know what righteous thinking or right thinking is? It's seeing from the affirmative at all times. It's seeing it's already done. It's seeing from the end. So when you pray and you offer the prayer of a righteous person, of a right thinking person, it's always to see from the end result or the affirmative. I see that my request, the desire of my heart is already accomplished. And I speak that kind of faith. I believe that I'm one with God and the very power and truth of this is flowing in me and through me and around me and for me. And we begin to feel this expression of love. We begin to feel this, that which we believe and profess to be true because every miracle requires that we meet these two. If you want to be empowered today, if you want to rise up today, if you want to be undergirded and sustained today, What you need to do is awaken to faith and love. They're offering you the right hand. They're offering it to you to lift you up and pull you up. They come together to lift us up into a higher understanding. They invite us to enter in then to the temple of God, to come in through the gate beautiful, to come in through the gate of understanding, to enter in into this presence. They enable us to walk. Faith and love enable us to walk above the chaos of this world. Enable us to walk where we may feel our life in victimhood, injured and unable to stand on our own. They enable us to receive our healing and to rise up in the power of truth. I want you to know this. This story is your story. And today, you may be just sitting outside the gate of your miracle, of that which you're believing for. You're on the cusp. You're almost there. You're just outside the gate. That miracle is so close. That manifestation of the divine presence, that healing you're praying for, that job that you're looking for, that manifestation of success and prosperity, that unfolding of God's love, that loving relationship that you're seeking, whatever it may be, you may be right on the cusp. You may be that lame man today sitting outside the gate beautiful, the gate of understanding and The Spirit of God today is sending you a wonderful message. Disciples, shall we say figuratively, coming to you and saying, faith and love are going to be the key for you to receive exactly that which you desire in your life. Begin to transform your thinking into right thinking that says, I believe, I believe. And the love I have is this emotion. I feel the love of God who is so generous and ever desiring to meet my very need, coming together with this faith, and it's lifting me. It's enabling me to enter in. I'm going to take the hand of truth today, and I'm going to walk through the gate of understanding. I'm going into the temple. I'm going into that sacred dwelling place. I'm moving into that place of communion with God, that temple that is symbolic of that place of prayer. I'm going to move in to the divine presence as I receive the hand of right thinking, as I welcome this picking me up, love and faith igniting together. I ask you now that are you welcome to receive something more than just the physical world, but to receive the spiritual that's waiting for you? It's there today. Will you take the hand? It's extended to you. The Spirit of God is extending the hand of right thinking and saying, take the hand, look up, take my hand and rise up. 
and receive your highest and best. For your miracle awaits you. Amen. Amen. Thank you.